Over 230 years ago, on July 4th, a collection of American patriots signed a document that would change the world. Ever since then, the Declaration of Independence has been an inspiration to freedom fighters all over the globe. In this seminar, we'll examine the philosophical currents of the mid-18th century that influenced the authors of the Declaration of Independence. According to political historian and Jeffersonian scholar Garrett Ward Sheldon, the ideas expressed in the Declaration of Independence can be traced to three schools of thought. Lockean liberalism, classical republicanism, and Calvinist Christianity. All three of these ideologies were popular among American colonists of the Revolutionary Period, and each one had a discernible influence upon the nation's founding document. A quick note of caution. In our context here, liberalism and republicanism represent classical theories that are not direct analogs of modern liberals and republicans. As we explore these theories, try not to think about how those terms are defined today. We may explore the evolution of these terms in a future seminar. So let's start with Lockean liberalism. John Locke was born a few years before the English Civil War broke out. Like most Puritans, his parents were on the side of the parliamentarians, against the absolute rule of the king. His father was an officer in the army of Oliver Cromwell, who would become Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England after the execution of King Charles I, in 1649. Keep these details in mind as we go over Locke's political philosophy. They will help explain his thinking. Locke was an extremely gifted student and worked with many noted scientists and thinkers while studying at Oxford University. He went on to achieve many accomplishments, including obtaining a medical degree and serving as secretary of the Board of Trade and Plantations. His most famous work, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, is considered a masterpiece of early empirical epistemology and had a profound influence on the modern Western conception of the self. It was his political writings, especially the two treatises of civil government, that had a tremendous impact on the founding fathers of the United States. Locke is widely considered the father of classical liberalism, a political philosophy concerned primarily with the defending the rights of the individual and limiting the power of government. The main aspects of Locke's political thought that can be found in the Declaration of Independence are citizens' equality and liberty, the role of government, and the right to revolution. For Locke, the political equality of all men was rooted in the fact that all were endowed by nature with the same basic physical faculties. This essential equality means that all men must be free to pursue their self-interests, as long as they don't impede the rights of others to do the same. The same sentiment is found in the second paragraph of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most people, Locke believed, were inclined to respect the rights and property of others. Yet there are always some that don't, and that is where government enters into his theory. According to Locke, the government exists solely to protect social order and justice. The aforementioned violators of others' rights require an impartial justice system, since the vast majority of people are too greedy and prideful to judge fairly in their own cases. So government is basically just there to safeguard private rights and requires consent of the governed at all times. Once again, from the Declaration of Independence, To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This leads to the final piece of Locke's theory. If a government loses the consent of its own people because it is unable to protect their rights, or worse yet, itself becomes a violator of those rights, 
then it is the right of the people to replace it. And so we read in the Declaration, Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government. Locke does make it clear, however, that this so-called right to revolution should not be taken lightly. He reminds his readers that every government will make mistakes, and citizens should be tolerant of a certain amount of bad laws and corruption. This idea is also expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Clearly, the signers of the Declaration were conscious of the fact that they themselves would become the government of a new nation and didn't want themselves to be held to an impossible standard of perfection. Locke's liberal theories applied not only to individuals, but also to nations. Just as a government needed the consent of its citizens, so also does a monarch need the consent of its territories. Locke did not at all believe in the absolute right of monarchs to rule. Remember his family background? Instead, he saw the king as an impartial judge between the various parts of his dominion. In this scenario, the United States of America would be equal partners with England, Canada, Australia, and every other part of the British Commonwealth. If the king proved incapable of being an honest broker, or trampled on the sovereign rights of any colony, then that colony had every right to secede and declare full independence. In light of King George's actions, the American colonists felt they had a God-given right to do what they did. The main criticism of Locke's theories were that they put such a great emphasis on property that his so-called universal rights were, in practice, only applied to property owners. In colonial America, that meant white males. Women, people of native or African ancestry, and even poor white males were usually excluded from fully participating in the decision-making processes of the new nation. Historian Howard Zinn claims that the primary motive for independence was economic, allowing colonial leaders to retain more of the business profits without having to share with the home country. Yet even if economics played a role, there is no doubt that the sanctity of individual rights has been a defining feature of the American dream. People from all over the world have aspired to the freedoms represented by the Declaration of Independence, and those freedoms have become available to more and more classes of people over the course of the nation's history. Here are some suggestions for discussion questions. What limits would you place on the freedom of individual citizens? What role do you think government should have in American society? What would it take for the government to lose your consent? How true do you think American society is to the ideal of liberty and justice for all? In what ways does Lockean liberalism continue to influence American political thought today? Another school of thought that influenced the drafting of the Declaration of Independence was classical republicanism. Republicanism is a political philosophy derived from ancient Greek and Roman thinkers, especially Aristotle, Polybius, and Cicero. The word republic comes from the Latin res publica, which roughly translates to public matter. The primary feature of a republic is that public offices are not inherited, but rather elected or appointed by an elected official. In ancient Athens, 
All citizens were considered equal and participated directly in the governance of the city-state. In the Roman Republic, there was a strong sense that a constitution and system of checks and balances were necessary to minimize abuses of power. The ideal Republican society consists of well-educated, middle-class citizens with an ethic of public virtue and sacrifice for the common good. Simplicity of lifestyle and economic frugality were also considered features of a strong and healthy society. In the Republican worldview, the cancerous features of monarchy, centralized power, materialistic extravagance, and shameless corruption, all went hand in hand. Sheldon described it like this. During the height of imperial power, whether the Roman Empire, the medieval Catholic Empire, or the 18th century British Empire, an emphasis was placed on high society, an over-concern with appearance, elegant clothes, expensive jewelry, powdered wigs, perfumes, and that was the men, gaudy display of luxury and wealth, large houses, carriages, artwork, moral decadence, sexual infidelity and license, drunkenness, perversion, and a prideful insistence on official titles, prestige, and pomp. The simple, frugal morality of the classical republican ideal regarded such imperial society as perverted vanity and corrupted morality. The influence of republicanism is quite apparent in the colonial leader's mockery of the fashion choices of England's ruling elite. Wigs, lace, and powder were considered signs of a haughty elite, as opposed to the humbler, simpler style of the colonists. The British elite may have mocked the Yankees as simpletons, but the colonists, in turn, poked fun at the dainty Brits as overly feminine. Examples of the influence of republicanism in the Declaration of Independence include references to the manly spirit and honor of the American cause, as well as the list of grievances against King George III, which included refusal to acknowledge laws passed by colonial legislatures for the common good, the concentration of power and making judges dependent on his will alone, the imposition of new taxes and severe regulation of trade. Another reason that classical republicanism became more popular as anti-English sentiment grew was that the colonists needed a source of heritage besides that of their occupiers. As a new nation, America was looking for a pantheon of heroes and ideas from which they could claim lineage and forge an identity separate from that of England. With its emphasis on direct democracy, decentralized power, and moral virtue, democratic Greece and republican Rome were obvious candidates. Here are some suggestions for discussion questions. Can you think of any cultural artifacts of the influence of classical republicanism on America's founders? In what ways does classical republicanism continue to exert an influence in America? Should direct democracy still be held up as a political ideal in today's complex world? The third philosophy with considerable influence on the Declaration of Independence is Calvinism, which is a branch of Protestant Christianity. John Calvin was born in France in 1509 and broke from the Roman Catholic Church at age 21. Due to religious oppression in France, Calvin fled to Switzerland and wrote his most famous book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, in 1536. He eventually became the leader of the reform movement in Geneva, and his ideas spawned an entire branch of Christianity, which includes the Reform, Congregationalist, and Presbyterian churches. 
A central feature of Calvinism is the belief in providence, the idea that God has a plan and history is governed by it. God's most important work, according to Calvin, is his church, and so Christian believers enjoy special protection by God throughout their lives. The importance of this belief is explained by Sheldon. This faith in God's power and help for his people led the American Christian colonists to believe that the Lord would bring them victory in the American Revolution because it was his will that they be free, unabused, and able to practice their Protestant faith unencumbered or oppressed by the hierarchical and heretical English or Roman Catholic Church. For the Puritans, Baptists, and other Americans of Calvinist persuasion, the political struggle against the king was mirrored by a spiritual struggle against corrupt church institutions. Once the vanguard of religious liberty, the Church of England was seen by Calvinist Christians as corrupt and decadent, no longer enjoying God's favor and protection. This religious component to the American Revolution would lead some colonists to conceptualize their struggle as a microcosm of the eternal battle between good and evil. They believed that America's faithfulness to God's natural law made them a special nation endowed with divine protection, an idea expressed these days as American exceptionalism. Sheldon wrote, The Lord would honor his covenant with America and miraculously give them victory against a much more powerful worldly adversary, as he had repeatedly delivered the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. In certain extremely Calvinist regions of New England, the Revolutionary War was seen as Armageddon, or the final battle between God and his servants and the Antichrist, which would usher in the rule of Christ. We see evidence of Calvinist influence on the Declaration of Independence in references to reliance on the protection of divine providence, laws of nature and nature's God, unalienable rights which follow from the divine origin of the law of nature. Here are some suggestions for discussion questions. What does the separation of church and state mean to you? Is the United States an exceptional nation, blessed with the protection and guidance of a supernatural entity? How can a society reconcile the moral imperatives of Calvinism with the individual freedoms of Lockean liberalism? What are the similarities between the three philosophies discussed in the seminar? What are the differences?